Hey channel, Fernando from SkyFi Audio. Today I'm gonna to do an actual product review. I haven't done one in a while. This particular piece was sitting on Ben's bench right over there and um, he had the top open and I, and I was reminded of the uh, exemplary quality of this particular preamp from Nakamichi. So I asked him to leave it open so that I could do a quick video and share it with you guys. Um, so this is Fernando from SkyFi Audio. Um, you can visit us online at skyfiaudio.com. I'm gonna take about 15 minutes to go over this piece, the CA7A, and it's matching amplifier, the Stasis PA7A2. This is a later version of the PA7. So uh, I'm gonna jump right in. We can tell a lot by the interior of a preamp uh, in terms of what it's gonna sound like. Uh, this is Nakamichi made components through 50, 60 years of all different levels of quality and performance, and a few of them stand out quite a bit, and that includes this CA7 and the matching amplifier, the PA7. There are other uh, units in the 7 lineup. There's, <coughs> excuse me, a tuner, there are cassette decks, uh, CD players, but they don't have quite the construction quality of these two pieces. I don't know why. I imagine they were trying to reach some sort of price point but it's unusual that, for example, they made a you know, matching preamp, but it's not anywhere near this quality level of component selection, layout, circuitry, design, etc. And I'll maybe show you the inside of a tuner so you can get a better sense of it. But first thing uh, that stands out is the quality of the chassis. This is not your typical stamped steel chassis that you find on every components from this price point. This is full aluminum. I'm talking full aluminum faceplate, sides, the back, even the top cover. Let's see if I can put it over here so you can get a sense of it. Look at the brush quality on this top cover. You know, it's about an eighth inch thick aluminum. And then when we flip it over, you can kind of get a sense for how well made it is. Same for the side panels here. You can see they're a bit thicker, extrude aluminum with his ribbing on it. Front panel is pretty standard for Nakamichi, extrude aluminum, and rear panel, um, really, really top notch. You can see the gold plated connectors throughout and the super high quality switches. So let me dive r right into it and, and show you a few things. Um, the first thing that stands out in terms of the controls is the, uh, the tone controls. They label them acoustic fine tuning. So a lot of people frown having tone controls on high-end preamps, but I'm a big fan of them, even if, especially if you have a vintage speaker and you want to try to get just a little bit more umph out of it, it's really nice to have a, a high quality tone control, but they're not all created equal. Some will completely distort the signal, some are over-exaggerated. I like them when they're subtle, and this is exactly that. Acoustic fine tuning is the naming convention they use, and they have a very small impact on the sound signature. Uh, and it's split into three bands, the low, the mid, and the high. So, uh, and you can also bypass it, which we like to see on, on preamps if you want to be fully purist. It's nice to be able to just bypass it, and this one you can with the push of a button. All right, um, going through the controls, um, we've got facilities for a, a phono, a CD, a tuner, uh, auxiliary two and one and two tape loops, which is nice. Obviously Nakamichi made cassette decks. That's what made him famous. So having two tape loops is, uh, is important for a piece like this. There's also an audio mute to, to lower the signal level, your standard volume control, which is both motorized and manual, a balanced, and then the record out selector again with the two uh, tape options little remote control sensor, and I'll talk more about the remote control. It has quite a great features on that as well. All right, I'm gonna unplug it so I can show you the layout. So even though uh, the circuitry is, is divided into left and right channels, it does share a common power supply. So it's not a true dual mono design, but uh, it's pretty close to it. Um, you can see the two large power supply sections here on the left, this one, according to my colleague Ben, powers the entire phono stage, the moving coil section of it. It's a fully regulated power supply and it's split right here. And the front power supply powers the rest of the preamp controls and signal path. Um, they use uh, gold-plated terminals throughout, 
which is interesting at this price point. Even the fuse buses uh, are gold, gold plated. And you can just tell the attention to detail and quality. Um, they really, really went far out on this particular piece. PC boards are made out of some material that is um, far superior than what you typically see from Japanese equipment of this era. And look at the controls themselves. Flip it over. Look at the quality of these potentiometers for both the tone and the selections. And uh, here is our volume control. The actual potentiometer sits in here. It's got a long flex shaft going to the knob in the front. And uh, here's the motorized section, pretty far away from the important bit. So they've located the motor at the front and put the potentiometer on the board where we like to see it. It's nicer to have it on the board than just having wires running to it. Um, here on this area here is the phono section. You can see uh, all the components necessary for moving coil. There aren't as many as necessary for moving magnet, but about, um, about half of this board is essentially the phono section. And we're looking at the left channel here up top, and there's an additional board just below it that you would access to the bottom panel for the other channel. Um, the switching for inputs is all relay based. So as you flip through the um, input selectors, or at least you press the buttons for the input selectors, you will hear the relays activate. Now that tends to be a weakness of most preamps of this age is the relays. We we often see machines that fail uh, from the contacts fail over time and the relays, but we haven't yet seen one from the CA7A with any bad relays. So we have a good feeling that there are a pretty high quality piece that is reliable. The other thing that's notable is uh, the lack of capacitors, uh, or at least um, the, the fact that they use uh, film capacitors throughout the signal path. And that's these guys right here. There are very few electrolytics present. As a matter of fact, on these particular boards here for the signal path and for the tone and, and control, I don't see a single capacitor. They are all film capacitors. Here's one here and here. The only time we see them are in the power supply stage, the electrolytics here. But they're super high quality electrolytics made by Nichicon for the audio world. So these are not likely to fail, at least in our lifetime. You can see this tiny uh, but pretty uh, oversized. Let me say that again. There are small in terms of power supplies compared to amplifiers, but they're fairly sizable for a preamp. And these are toroidal power supplies or transformers here. And again, one for the phone section and one for the, the rest of the unit. Um, I think that's about it. Let me show you the back. So in the back, we noted the gold-plated connectors, the aluminum chassis. Um, this is a, a universal unit, so you do have voltage selectors or the ability to choose what country you're in. This entire section here is for remote control, and that's what makes this a pretty unique preamp. Um, this has the ability to connect to other Nakamichi devices, quite a few of them. You can actually connect through these umbilicals to tape decks from Nakamichi, and there's a long list in the manual as to which tape decks you can use, but it allows you to essentially use the remote control that comes with the CA7A, which is a pretty generic remote control here, and actually control your tape decks, which is pretty cool. And specifically, if you use the CR7A, um, you know, the famed uh, tape deck that we often restore, which is, um, you know, comparable to a Nakamichi Dragon, you can control the azimuth on the tape deck through the remote control. And that is brilliant. Um, so you would connect this to the cassette deck and not only control its, its transport, you know, play, fast forward and rewind, but also connect, control its azimuth, which is uh, super cool. Uh, this particular unit, you can see here that someone's replaced these, um, the output RCA jacks. Likely they failed from having a bad connector in there that it stressed them out. It's not uncommon, but uh, they did do a nice job attaching these to the PC board and the rest of them are gold plated. Um, on the left, most notably, is the ability to hook up both moving coil and moving magnet cartridges and the loading and capacitance are, are set right here. Here's a grand wire and as we can see, this is the entire lower right row is the right channel and the upper row is the left channel. And this is what I was referring to where it's almost a dual mono design, the top board 
has all these connectors and the mirror image is just below. It's a nice layout. In addition to controlling the functions, it also can control the power of other Nakamichi devices. So you can potentially use this as your control center. Uh, they make a, I mentioned a tuner, they make a cassette, obviously the CR7, a cassette deck, and the OMS7 CD player, and the PA7 amplifier. The power control can all be done from here so that by turning on this preamp, you can turn on the rest of the system, which we love as well. All right, looking on the manual, um, in particular, it comes with a sheet for calibrating or setting your phono cartridge. If you've got a moving coil cartridge, there is a section here or a, a place where you can insert a calibrating resistor, and that will allow you to choose the load impedance for your, for your phono section for moving coils. So it comes with a sheet illustrating which capacitors you would use. Pretty well done. Here is a close-up of that. Um, the manual is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's an international affair where it is in English, um, or at least this version is, but there are plenty of uh, diagrams in it. Here is uh, an illustration of how you would connect some of the tape decks, a CD player, etc. Here's the amplifier, tape deck number one, tape deck number two. Uh, here's the power control we refer to. Not much else in here. Uh, maybe some instructions on, on how to use the, most of the controls, especially the, the remote functions, which are a bit more complex than your average preamp. So overall, pretty cool um, and much better than we're used to seeing from this era. So this is what we call a sleeper, you know, a, a vintage um, item that may have gone overlooked. Uh, I looked online and I could not find any really good articles on this preamp, which is surprising considering how good it sounds and how well it performs. So um, these are the kind of gems we like to sort of find and, and bring forward. So um, you know, look for this on our website. This particular piece will go on, uh, on sale probably this week. And um, price range is gonna depend on how serviced it's been. You probably pick one of these up on eBay for under $1,000. Uh, and if you want one that's been fully sorted out in this kind of condition and completeness, you know, you're gonna be pushing uh, into the teens. So uh, let me move on to its, uh, its sibling, which is the uh, PA7A2. Uh, later version, uh, the earlier one was the PA7A. Uh, this is a 225 watt per channel um, amplifier using the Stasis technology pioneered by Nelson Pass. Um, it shares a lot of the same design language and quality as the preamp. Uh, we can see the heavy, heavy use of extruded aluminums for not just the heat sinks, but for the faceplate, the rest of the chassis, really, really well made uh, for this era. Same Nichicon capacitors and size of a large uh, beer can and the monster power supply that powers it all. One of the things that's notable about it is its simplicity, and this is typical of Nelson Pass. Single PC board, containing all the circuitry necessary for each of the two channels. There's no subboards or messy wiring anywhere. It's really just very, very clean and very well executed. And a lot of the simplicity really comes out in the sound of uh, all of the designs from this gentleman. On the back, absolute bare necessity. Single set of uh, five-way binding posts, a fuse, IC socket, and uh, left and right RCAs, and look at the quality of, the, of these connectors. And one of the nice things we like to see on, on amplifiers of this weight and size is feet at the bottom. You know, this allows you to kind of manage the size and weight of this amplifier. It lets you sit it up on its back and carry it through its carrying handles in the front. So this together with the CA7 is a killer combination. Uh, Price-wise on these, uh, the market is, is sort of fluctuating on these up and down, and again, it depends on how sorted out it is and what the condition is, but you can expect to pay anywhere between $1,500 and $2,500 for one that's been well cared for. We happen to have uh, four or five of these right now in stock. We got a, a nice lot from a single collector, uh, along with the uh, CD player and, and tuner. And uh, just magically, the tuner appeared. Thank you, Ben. This is... Um, ST7, so same series, looks exactly uh, like a, a sibling to the other two pieces, but as you can see internally, it has nothing to do with it. 
from its sort of stamped steel painted chassis to the material used on the circuit boards, the use of electrolytic capacitors throughout, and this sort of messy wiring and layout. It's a good sounding tuner, don't get me wrong, but nowhere in the league of the other two pieces, as you can see. And if I show you the CD player, it would look pretty much the same on this inside. All right, my camera died, but it gave me an opportunity to pull out the CD player and show you the OMS 7A2. This is the sibling to the other pieces we've been discussing. Fairly conventional in its design and execution, but just as flimsy as the tuner and the cassette decks in terms of construction. Here you see the stamped steel chassis and, uh, and the lower quality components throughout. All right, and then I noticed Ben was calibrating one of these amplifiers, so maybe let's uh, let's see what he's up to. So right now I just have two voltmeters connected, one on each channel, and the service manual on this specific model is looking for 40 millivolts DC across the uh, the test points here. So this channel is right in spec at about 38 millivolts. Um, this one I need to trim up. So I've just been waiting for these to warm up. And I just need to trim this little resistor here. And we can see the bias voltage coming up. So I just need to tweak this out and let these warm up. And once it stabilizes, I'll make sure this locks into about 40 millivolts. And uh, then we'll do a full output power test on this before it gets ready to list. I imagine that one of the symptoms of an amplifier that's not biased is a differential in temperature between the left and right channels, is that right? In class A, definitely, you can see it. This is a, um, an AB design as far as I know, so right now the heat sinks are pretty cool. So these aren't going to start cooking until you, um, until you start ramping up the power. So if you were listening really loud, these would start to get hot. But um, in a class AB amplifier, the idle current is pretty low, so the heat sink should be uh, cool to maybe a little bit warm depending on the amplifier design. All right. Anything uh, anything else notable on the design or the? I really like the there? power switch. It's like a, a a big chunky, you know, click in and out. I don't want to turn it on right now because I'm I'm waiting for the circuit to stabilize for the bias adjustment. But I really like the the power control on it, um, and the handles. It's just I think you mentioned it earlier. It's great to be able to carry this thing around and set it on its back. So for a big heavy power amplifier, it's actually really easy to move around. And the heat sinks are kind of rounded. So they're not as sharp as they look. A lot of times on these super heavy power amplifiers, you can give yourself a really nasty cut on the heat sink. So um, just good design all around. All right. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right. So that wraps it up. Um, thanks for watching. If, uh, if you enjoy the videos, uh, I'd love to earn uh, your subscription. If you can subscribe to our channel, recommend it to others, or give us a thumb up, thumbs up, that would be amazing. And uh, be sure to leave comments. I'd love to hear from all of you. Uh, I tend to make a lot of mistakes in these videos. I am not shy about that, so please let me know where I goofed and uh, and uh, let us know uh, what you think about these pieces and uh, and visit us online, of course, skyfiaudio.com, where you can see thousands of items. Uh, we've got a ton of ton of stuff. Oh, and for you car fans, you often ask, uh, well, what's on the lift? Well, today we've got a Escort RS Cosworth, um, 1992 edition, the Motorsport edition, uh, rec recent acquisition. Super happy with this car. It's, uh, it's one of my uh, favorite cars from the 90s. This would have been a rally car made in Germany. Uh, you can see it here up on the left. I'll show you a better view of it uh, down the road in other videos. As you can see, I pulled the suspension out of the front. And yes, this is in fact a car floating in our shop. It is kept up there. And uh, even though we're pretty tight, uh, it's really nice to have a lift uh, or access to a lift on a repeated basis. So the drive shafts were pulled out. I am refurbishing them in my spare time. I spend most of my time working on hi-fi equipment, but uh, when I want to change speeds, I switch over to uh, put on my uh, my worker car repair hat, and uh, I am doing the CV joints. A uh, common failure on these cars um, it was leaking uh, grease throughout, so uh, just restoring those now. And, uh, but other than that, the car is pretty sorted out. It's a really cool piece. If you don't know about the Ford Escort RS Cofford, looking online, it's, uh, it's pretty rare and unique, especially in this country. So uh, thanks for watching, guys, and uh, stay in touch.